Hello everyone and welcome to today's Energy Storage News webinar with HMS Networks. I'm Andy Colthorpe, editor at Energy Storage News, part of the Solar Media Group. Today we'll be talking about data and communications challenges facing battery energy storage systems or BESS for short. There's a growing recognition that battery storage has a vital role to play in the low carbon smart energy system of the future. But like any network, the energy system is only as strong as its weakest link. And we can only get to low carbon and smart if our approach to connecting and interfacing battery storage and other energy resources with the technologies that can control and dispatch them is also smart. We'd all like more standardization in certain areas of our lives. We see different types of chargers and sockets for our smartphones. We see some electric vehicle chargers that aren't interoperable, different types of code and operating systems. Waking up to find an automatic update has turned your desktop computer into an unfamiliar place and even different sizes and shapes of coffee pod. It would be nicer if these things could be standard and perhaps it's not that different when it comes to battery storage. It's a relatively new, if rapidly maturing technology and that means a lot of solutions have to be tailored on a project by project basis. And it also means connecting up different hardware and software from different providers. Today, our speakers will address how those challenges can be overcome with flexible approaches to data and communications so that battery storage deployment at scale can more seamlessly integrate into energy networks. Joining us today are Matt Schustack, HMS Networks, America's Business Development Manager. Hi, Matt. And Yuan Li, who's HMS Networks Business Development Manager for the EMEA region. Hi, Yuan. Hello, guys. As always, interaction with you, our audience, is really important to us. And uh, today's session, we have something a little bit different. We'll be running four quick polls, which you can respond to from the box on the right hand side of your screen. So keep an eye out for those as they'll be coming up shortly. And additionally, we will, as always, be living, leaving a few minutes at the end for questions from the audience. So please enter those in a separate tab, also on the right hand side of your screen, helpfully marked questions. And also just to note that today's session is being recorded and the recording and slides will be available uh, for all registrants. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over to our first speaker today. Over to you, Matt. Thank you, Andy. And thank you uh, to all of our guests for investing some of your time with us uh, today. As Andy said, our goal is to make this a more interactive session. So we'll be asking for uh, some of your input and your perspective on some of these, uh, let's say, interesting topics, at least from our, from our vantage point. Uh, th so thanks in advance for your participation. Let's take a quick run through our high level agenda for today. First, we want to just set the stage a little bit with some context uh, by taking a look at the market situation as a whole regarding battery storage. Then we're going to highlight some of what we're calling headwinds, uh, specifically in the areas of data and communication, which is obviously our, our specialty. And then we want to unpack each of these uh, headwinds a little bit further. And as you can see, we're going to have a few different audience poll questions um, along the way. So, and then from there, of course, we'd like to uh, you know, summarize the results and have a quick Q&A session. One second for me here. So, uh, if you're not already familiar, I just would like to give you a very brief uh, abbreviated version of an introduction to HMS. Uh, I'd like to say that we provide full stack machine-to-machine uh, -machine data communication solutions starting with our Anybus technology, which enables communications um, anywhere from the embedded device level to standalone multi-protocol uh, intelligent gateway solutions. Um, Anybus also has a focus, uh, keen focus on wireless technology. Um, Ixat is a subject matter expert really um, regarding CAN communications um, and some related, you could say tangential uh, protocols. And Ixop provides a holistic portfolio of hardware and software tools. Um, Ewan technology specializes in secure remote access uh, and IoT data collection solutions. 
and they're often combined with our web factory, um, which is a web-based dashboarding and SCADA solution. Uh, Percentec is a company providing diagnostic and predictive tools for uh, industrial network health analysis and troubleshooting. And last but certainly not least, uh, I guess to wrap it all together, HMS provides integration support services for any and all of our solutions uh, as an additional value add to our customers. From a sort of global perspective, uh, we like to say that we shape the connected world. Um, the light blue dots here are meant to show um, actual connected install, installed HMS products. Um, it's more of a visual. I'm sure there's more than what's shown here, but um, and the dark circles actually represent uh, physical locations for HMS. Um, so we serve 16 countries worldwide and a strong network of uh, over 50 uh, rep partners. So let's let's jump into the topic for today. Uh, from a, a macro perspective, let's say, um, simply stated, and as, and as Andy had mentioned, our successful transition to renewables and electric transportation is inevitably going to hinge on our ability to deploy energy storage rapidly and at a wide scale. Uh, there are a lot of different areas and applications for energy storage, uh, ranging from just overall grid support and peak shaving to industrial uh, backup and EV charging, just to name a few. Uh, some of the market projections on the, the CAGR of energy storage show over a 36% um, compound annual growth rate through the year 2030. Uh, some studies show obviously much, much higher, but this is just a, a, general, uh, a general idea. 36% is, is a pretty big number. And if we look at 2030, the total storage capacity that's going to be needed is roughly 220, 221 gigawatts. That's a big number, uh, but I, I personally think that's kind of hard to grasp. Um, obviously, it's a large figure, but what does that really mean in terms of scale? Uh, so to try to illustrate that, we took an example from a battery OEM who offers modular uh, battery pack and battery rack solutions. And one of their racks equates to roughly a 370 kilowatt hour uh, output. So doing some simple math, um, 220 gigawatt hours total represents roughly 600,000 battery racks uh, from this manufacturer, for example, that will need to be deployed uh, globally. So I just want to let that number sink in. 600,000 is a pretty big number in uh, just a few short years, really. So the question, uh, one of the questions is, how exactly are we going to get there? Um, and when we dig into some of the details, especially at the you know, bits and bytes level uh, where HMS lives, we at least foresee a number of what we're calling headwinds. Um, now, while not, um, not, not every battery energy storage system uh, communicates actively, let's say, to the local uh, energy grid today, there's an actual communication interface there. Um, but as energy storage becomes more ubiquitous, this is going to become a necessity. Um, so unfortunately, though, grid protocols, the communication protocols vary regionally, and there's not likely to be any sort of global standard anytime soon. So it's going to become advantageous from a total cost of ownership standpoint to sort of future proof uh, the, the, the best systems to achieve a more flexible and plug and play integration, regardless of the region. Uh, again, if, if we're gonna get to that sort of scale. So from the, uh, sorry, for the, for the next, let's say headwinds, um, and we're, we're using a, an iceberg analogy, which we're all familiar with. Um, the labor shortage is, is very real already and available manpower is going to continue to decrease. And on top of that, uh, the cost of travel is only going to increase. So when we really consider the true cost of ownership, you know, specifically the, the installation, the commissioning, and, and really long-term ownership, long-term maintenance uh, of best systems, this is where we at least see 
sort of an iceberg effect, right? Uh, we're using an 80-20 rule for effect here. This is by no means an, a, a precise calculation, but the, the premise is um, regardless of which party these the, the true costs fall onto, you know, the cost of install commissioning maintenance is going to become potentially unmanageable at scale unless we can properly leverage technology. Right? And so companies who are thinking about this are looking for ways uh, to sort of proactively de-risk and, and minimize these costs. So the third topic pertains to really the continuous improvement and optimization uh, of, of energy storage systems. So system performance in all aspects, whether it's at output efficiencies, um, the safety, the reliability in general, maybe just the, the whole lifespan, going to need continuous improvement. That's sort of that's sort of obvious, um, and naturally, it's sort of obvious that this process, this continuous process, is going to require us to lean on technology uh, once again to leverage the massive amounts of data uh, available from these systems. But how exactly? This is the question. How exactly are we going to? implement and deploy these sort of AI and, and ML solutions efficiently and cost effectively at scale. Again, it comes back to the scale question. That's terrific, Matt. Thanks very much for the high level introduction on those headwinds. And, you know, I think I particularly find the iceberg analogy quite a powerful one in terms of that whole question of ownership, which, you know, I think is yeah, it's very much, if not for life, then, you know, it's a decades long um, relationship that people will have uh, to their investment or their project, really, I guess. So we'd like to kick off the polls for today. And our first is a kind of two part poll, really, I guess you could call it, um, with uh, two separate sub polls. But, you know, we've numbered them one or two for simplicity, obviously. So. Um, Matt, could you perhaps do us the honors and read out the options here? So, poll one is which northbound external communications protocols most best systems support, and um, you know which which of those do people commonly find uh, to be supported for their best projects? Right. So, so the question, uh, if if it's not clear, what we're trying to ask is if we illustrate northbound or external communications versus internal. So external being if there is if there is any um, external connectivity from the uh, energy storage system itself, what is it that the energy storage companies are providing or offering? Um, now we have a combination of a couple different protocols here. Some of them are more, let's say, grid integration related. So uh, Modbus TCP is obviously a pretty generic, you could say, protocol that a lot of systems will support. But then some are also also supporting um, the 6870, also known as 104, um, the 61850, which are much more grid um, specific, or DNP3, for example. Um, again, those four are more you know, direct grid automation uh, type protocols. And then we also put MQTT and OPC UA as more of the IoT protocols because many of these systems do have some kind of cloud connectivity. Just curious what uh, the audience sees as a, let's say, most commonly used uh, by the best systems, by the best um, integrators themselves. Thanks very much, Matt. And just to note, everybody, that to take part in the poll, the options are on the right hand side of your screen in the polls tab. And yeah, the second poll there, Matt, do you want to just quickly talk through the internal communications protocols options there? Right. So so I kind of skimmed past this, this the internal topic on uh, the, the intro, but to unpack that a little bit. So question number one is external. Question number two is more inside of the BES, um, whether it's to, let's say, the battery and BMS systems or other sort of sub systems. What types of protocols uh, do, do the audience see used most commonly? Um, yeah, and again, you can pick multiple. Most likely, you're going to see more than one. Um, so, really, what uh, what folks are seeing out there on, from from their perspective. And just to be clear, we have two different CAN options here. I'm not sure if this is obvious to the group or not. Option number one is more traditional uh, CAN bus or and or CAN open. 
question or option two is can fd which is flexible data rate um, which is um and a very much up and coming uh, topic inside of the automotive world which is of course where a lot of the development uh, for the battery packs comes from just curious if anyone's seen that yet okay interesting stuff okay excellent Okay, Matt, so why don't you then take us through then the first discussion of that first headwind around um, data protocol flexibility and integration flexibility. And we'll come back in and check on those two polls um, as we come to the end of that section then. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Andy. So just, just to sort of unpack, I guess, why are we asking this question? Obviously, we'd like your input, um, but let's just kind of break this down a little bit. So when we think about the internal communications topic, so left-hand side of the page here, let's just, uh, I guess, build on my, my previous comment. Let's look at the battery, for example, one of the subsystems. Obviously, this is the heart of the system, uh, but there's a similar storyline, you could say, for other components and, and systems inside the BES. Uh, so most, if not all, uh, BES OEMs, let's call it, are continuously evaluating and reevaluating battery partners for a multiple uh, in a multitude of reasons right and it could be cost it could be just materials availability um, just to name two so as such it's kind of attractive for them to have more flexibility to seamlessly integrate um, different battery hardware architectures or migrate between suppliers ideally with minimal uh, redesign effort um, so that's that's kind of the catch here. So it's not that it can't be done. Um, it's about the continuous redesigning of your system just to accommodate different battery uh, suppliers. So one option that uh, folks are considering here for, you could call it future proofing, is utilizing a more intelligent multi-protocol gateway uh, to act as sort of an intermediary translator uh, or data aggregator. So the gateway, in this sense, uh, manages the, the flexibility to accommodate the different protocols and allows, in this case, the best OEM and their EMS, for example, to sort of standardize their hardware interface and potentially even their the software and the code on their side, again, while still achieving you know, the, the, the flexibility, um, what you could say, underneath the gateway, if that's making any sense here. Uh, and similarly, on the right side, if we think about external, um, again, while not all systems today are communicating to the grid, as more and more and more BEST systems, as BEST becomes a, a, a larger part of our energy grid as a whole, um, this is going to be a necessity right, to, to, to automate uh, the grid. So again, similar, similar topic, because grid protocols do vary uh, globally, uh, almost all the way down to the DSOs, there's no clear standard. If best companies are going to be flexible and, and scalable, they need to be more plug and play. So it's a similar storyline uh, to accommodate different grid protocols. They can sort of outsource, you could say, that task, that translator task to uh, an intelligent piece of hardware and standardize their own hardware and, and software on their on their end while still achieving the flexibility. So let's I'm curious really what uh, what the audience is is seeing here. Excellent. Yeah, so we have yeah, quite a lot of uh, audience members um, did already vote. So that's really good. We've got nearly 40 uh, 40 of you voted in both of these. So for the, so let's just take a quick look at the results, shall we, Matt? We've got the northbound communication protocols, uh, in fact, in top place with 53%, just gone up to 54% of the vote. Excited to see that happen in real time. Modbus TCP um, mm -hmm. and running very close second and then third, you've got MQTT on 13 uh, percent dmp3 and third but just two percent behind that uh, and then really actually not a lot between those four in fact so you've got 61850 as on nine percent so just two percent behind dmp3 
um, and then 60, 87, 0 or 104 uh, on 8%. And then uh, much further back in the rear, uh, OPC uh, UA with uh, 4% of the votes. We'll do the southbound or internal communication protocols in a second, but does that broadly tally with what you would have expected, Matt? A large majority for Modbus TCP and then the others kind of in a similar grouping, but with MQTT out in the lead of the also rounds, you could, if you could call them that. So, yeah, thanks, Andy. It's really interesting to see. I think it is pretty consistent. Uh, so if we just talk about external, I would say that, yes, a majority of uh, energy storage systems that I've come across at, at minimum will support Modbus TCP if there's a connection to the grid. It's, it's easy enough to do, it's not too complicated. Um, there's, there's a number of challenges with it, but it's, it's not surprising there. And then you see sort of a, a trail, if we, if we talk about DNP3 and the IECs, sort of a roughly even split uh, uh, of, a, of a tail off there. So the, those three uh, account for, what is it, roughly, roughly 30%, 27%, um, they, they split that, which also makes sense because it, that, if there is something grid specific, it seems to vary by geography. So for example, North America, we still see, I believe a lot of DNP3. Uh, Europe, we see a lot of 61850. Uh, South America is kind of an even split of 61850 and 6870. It, uh, it, it's consistent. So it's good to see um, that, that the audience seems to seems to agree. And this is a little bit of a detailed, you know, bits and bytes question. So um, um, I'm sure there's plenty in the audience who may not get to this level of detail uh, in, in their interaction. So appreciate the feedback right. there. Right. OK. And sorry, just really quickly then on the southbound or internal communications protocols, we see that uh, Modbus TCP, again, a winner, but much less clear is the margin there. So 39 percent of our audience uh, went with Modbus TCP being most common in second place uh, can and can open um, Modbus RTU. Uh, so it's nearly 30% for CAN and CAN Open. Uh, the others on a smaller percentage, uh, with the exception of CAN FD. So one person, you were curious to know if anyone has come across yeah. that. One person has. So there you go uh, from that sample size. And MBUS uh, zip uh, 0%. Um, I mean, I guess, you know, as you said, the, it's a bits and bytes kind of question, Matt. But just to wrap that up and before we move on to the next one, um, is there, in your view, a right or wrong answer? And, you know, it's a bit of a leading question to ask it that way. What was sure. your view? Uh, there, there is no right or wrong answer at all. Uh, I would say it's also consistent. Um, majority of systems will support Modbus, even internally. Um, again, it's, it's, it's simple enough, generic enough. The CanFD, I would love to, to uh, catch up with whomever is actually seeing CanFD used inside of BEST today. Um, just just for pure uh, curiosity um we're wondering if that's if that's the direction things are going so um curious who's already seeing that but awesome well back. maybe maybe that person will reach out and you can uh, yeah continue that one offline so excellent so without further ado we go on to uh the next section where we're looking at operations uh, commissioning provisioning and maintenance and we'll be back with another poll a little bit later on actually oh actually no sorry we won't we're yeah. going to launch poll number three because that's what we agreed in the script and i'm sorry about that everyone so okay just to ramp up the excitement even more uh we've got a live element here in our presentation so poll three and um, we were looking to so again right hand side of your screen please to respond and again thanks to everyone who did respond thus far so which of these remote management capabilities are most valuable for your business? So as Matt said, you know, you can pick more than one option. So I guess if two of them are equal, then, then we'll see. Um, but I guess, you know, if you were to pick one, go with that. And would it be unmanned real-time access and remote desktop access? Would it be over-the-air updates um, and flashing? Is it remote monitoring and data visualization or dashboarding? Uh, you could also choose remote group commissioning, provisioning, or on-demand diagnostics uh, and troubleshooting. 
And uh, yeah, we'll we'll leave those. Any comments on on that poll there, guys? Before we move on. Thanks, Jamie. I was just going to say we're going to delve into each of these. So so if it's not clear what we're referring to with each of these, let's say answers. Hopefully, it will be in the next minute. So if if you're unsure of your uh, uh, of your opinion or your answer based on options we give you, maybe just give us a, a minute to to unpack each of these. Hang fire, hang fire, and uh, and listen up to the presentation, then, guys. Okay, thanks very much. Right. So, so yeah, thank you, Andy. Yeah. So, so uh, the 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 second headwinds uh, uh, from our uh, HMS uh, naval point of view is that we foresee that uh, uh, we are expecting that the 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 bad system is going to be scaled up in the coming years, and after that, I think more and more. Uh, uh, company will start facing the operations bottleneck. How to improve the total cost of ownership after these type of uh, bad systems have been rolled out geographically for their project, for their users, for the end users. And uh, then we start thinking that remote management is going to be a very key element uh, to improve the total cost of ownership for operations. Because when you start installing the bad system, of course, the capital investment is important. However, after that, the system is going to be there for more than 10 or 20 years. So after that, the continuous operating operations uh, cost is also going to be very important. And under the remote management, actually, we can also split into different aspects. And today, what we are trying to list out is kind of the four aspects under remote management. That most of the people that in the industrial IoT area, we are always talking about. And I think it is also going to happen in the battery energy storage systems uh, application and market. And the first one we are discovering is uh, the remote monitoring and the data visualizations. So in AKA like dashboarding. So even you have one or two uh, system having rolled out, you also want to have a clear look about the, the, the data from the system itself. And after we sort up the integration about how to bring the data remotely to the central point and we can start making some data visualizations. And you can based on that to start remote monitoring your assets geographically and make the right business decisions and to improve your probabilities for these energy storage systems. And the second one that we see recently during the COVID pandemic, there is a very kind of a growing uh, demand in the market because of the travel restrictions that uh, the people are not able to go abroad so they are not able to send the maintenance people if there is issues. So amended and real-time access uh, capabilities as a remote management is also growing tremendously in the past few years. And I think it is also going to be a crucial topic for the best system. If each of best systems have been implemented in the field side, how the company's maintenance needs system can easily remote access to the system to do remote maintenance instead of buying a flight ticket, take on the flight and fly to overseas and to do maintenance locally. So that is something is kind of uh, giving you a good improvement on the operation cost uh, after you grow out the system. And the third one, which we found is the, the over the air capabilities for each systems. So the over the air capabilities that we are talking about here is not individual uh, system It's more like if you have uh, a system running in the field side with your best system. You have a software and there is a coming firmware from your battery vendors and how you are able to update in the firmware for the BMS system, for your communication system locally. And also if there is some kind of vulnerability issues on the software, how you be, are able to avoid that and flashing your local unit geographically without any uh, kind of big investment to send the engineer to do this type of uh, uh, treatment. And last but not the least, since we are talking about uh, the scale is going to be growing significantly, then which means when you start implement a massive amount of bad system, one of the important one of the topic will pop up. This is also something that we found in the other industrial IoT field is that how to do remote group commissioning and provisioning, which means that you have all of this system rolling out geographically or maybe rolling out in one place or in one countries. How you can 
give them a group configurations remotely and automatically instead of having engineers sit one by one together with the system and spend their time to do the configurations that is simply can be can be improved by having a remote commissioning tools chain that can help you to create a configuration profile and you can just push the button and it will roll out geographically into your systems. And this is also something can help you to decrease the human error when there is engineer configuring in the field side for each of the system. So I think these four aspects is something that we see is going to be growing in the coming years inside the best market because when we see the growing amounts and the volume on the best installations, these four uh, topic will become very crucial. So Andy, maybe we can have a look on what is the results from the audience? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Let's do that. So again, lots of um, audience members voted in this one. So thank you very much. Nearly half of the, uh, the entire crowd actually this time. So yeah, the uh, uh, the interaction only goes up and we've got one more poll at the end. So we'll see if we can engage all of you to, to reply to that one. Let's, let's see what happens. So um, I think, you know, we we're discussing in rehearsal what your expectations were. And I think this maybe tallies with some of the things you guys were saying you on, but uh, remote monitoring and data visualization or dashboarding comes in top uh, with 49% of the vote. Um, which is a pretty high number. We'll discuss all of those in a second. And then in second, you have unmanned real-time access or remote desktop access um, at 21%, so less than half uh, as popular as, a, as an answer. Uh, just a little bit behind that is on-demand diagnostics and troubleshooting, 16% of the vote. Over the, update, uh, over the air update, sorry, um, was 9%. And then slightly behind that with just 5% of the vote was remote group commissioning or provisioning. I mean, I was wondering if that kind of broadly tallies with what you would have thought you won. And I mean, I guess, yeah, let's start with that and see and see what you guys have to say. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so and it really, it's, it's actually just like what we're expecting during our rehearsal it, because we are thinking that the, the result is coming to this that remote monitoring and data visualizations dashboarding is is kind of the biggest topic at the moment. It's actually basically reflecting on where we are now in the best market. You know what is the market now we are at for the best in the market. So you can see that currently most of the project they are ruling out, but they are still. Uh, it's not running out in a very higher, it's not out in a very high scale. It's still on the small or medium sized implementations. And we can also see that some semi industrial cons customers, they also require the best system for the backup uh, power. Uh, and uh, those type of installations, the most important thing will be, of course, the remote monitoring data visualizations, because you have going to have a huge amount of customers and uh, how you can have uh, ideas to provide them some dedicated insight for them for their daily usage and remote monitoring and data violation is the top one. And this is also something that all of the vendors is now offering inside the market. And when we look at the unmended remote access and the, the third option is that this will come to the market and also this will this change will start bringing to the market from the end customers when the rollout and the demand is starting to become a high volume demand from single customers instead of a huge amount of customers, but it's going to be like one government project required several gigawatt installations in several geographical coverage. The first mandate that everyone needs to bring in is how you can do over here updating, how you can do remote group commissioning to save their cost on implementations. So I think it is basically is really reflecting on our expectation. And we do expect this trend will change a bit in 2023 and 2024. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a lot to be said in terms of, you know, you talking about the cost of ownership being, you know, essentially some of the costs are up front, but most of them are kind of hidden further out into the distance. And talking of hidden, you know, I think as media, we write, I think, a lot and we get a lot of attention given to hardware maintenance and, 
generally that means things like battery cells, cell degradation in lithium ion battery systems, uh, but then also kind of, you know, mechanical things like HVAC systems and things like that. So just in terms of the sort of maintenance that you need for non-battery and non-mechanical components. So I think we're talking about really software and kind of, you know, the interface kind of smart energy interface kind of equipment. What sort of maintenance is required for that? Do you think that people aren't so aware of maybe? Yeah, I, I would say that, I mean, when, when we look at this type of uh, improvements from the market on the mechanical part and also on the HVAC, the other system together, but all of these systems now, they are starting to have intelligence, which means they will have a small computer board inside to do the control and to deliver their values. Yeah. However, when this type of system have been installed in the field side, if they are being installed today in 20, 20 seconds, after three years, five years, the software vulnerability issues will popping up. And also for this type of solution provider, they also have their new ideas and new features coming up. However, you are not able to go to each stations to update all these type of features. So the remote access, remote management capability is something can help you to improve and to optimize it also to improve your capability for the future. If there is software vulnerability, how you can resolve it with, with the minimized cost. And also if there's new features coming up from your vendors for HVAC, for other systems, or maybe for PMS, how you can update that into your current assets, which you already implement. And this can help the company for the best, including the best companies building up the, the entire system, also the future maintenance companies. They can bring up the continuous revenue stream by providing this type of updates. And that is something that can help the, 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 the companies to think about, now we do this one-time project or maintenance project afterwards, how we can add up more and more values to to, to attract customers to go with our solutions. And I think that is going to be very important when the competitors is growing up in this market, everyone is trying to improve their soft skills. Yeah, so I think that is quite important for the management topic. Yeah. Excellent, and you know, I think that's uh, probably a, a good way to take us into actually the, the next topic area, I guess. So if you wanna carry on with that, um, yeah. and we'll come back to the next poll after that next section, thank you. Sure. So. Uh, on, on the third half wings, actually, what we are looking at is that uh, we are now looking at status quo, what we can do, what we can offer, and think a bit ahead. However, you can see in the industrial markets, there is some buzzwords that we have heard about, we have been bombarded in this past few years, is artificial intelligence, 5G, AIoT, how we can make our assets more intelligent. And we are also thinking that this is going to become another baby ad for the best manufacturers in the coming years. Is that how we can enable the AIOT starting from now, start to think from now for, for your dis design on your uh, system. How we can enable the AIOT for futures, especially on workflow improvements and the probabilities and efficiency for your best systems. So currently, when we're looking at now, today's, what we have is we have some very uh, interesting and powerful technologies for data communication. Also, as Matt mentioned a bit about the protocols, how we can integrate different systems to the systems and bring up the data. And now we have these data collecting together in the centralized monitoring systems. And what we can do at now is that we can do data visualizations, we can do decision makings, we have visibilities about these assets and how we can improve that after we have these data. So we can further look into another step is that after we have these data in the futures, how we can leverage the artificial intelligence and the data analytics from the markets, from the research to help us to optimize the battery systems efficiency and also to improve the safety, the readabilities, and also come to more is that how we can do predictive maintenance before the, the, the system itself is going to be having issues. And this is something that we can basically, based on the data we have, the big data we have, and we can fit into the cloud AI training systems and to come out uh, models can help you to make these decisions. And after that, there's also some new technologies popping up is that you can also 
provision these AI models and this intelligence into the field site, into your local bad system, because your local bad system, they have computing powers. They are not just a dumb device. They are not just a mechanical device. They have computing power on board. So, which means you can deploy this AI model have been trained from the cloud into the field and to do local inference, to do local decision making by itself to make them become more intelligent and to have a more efficient uh, time critical decision making process. And it can help you to optimize the current workflow inside your best systems. And together with that, you can also start filling up the data and put it into a loop. So from day to day, from now to the future, you can keep optimizing your entire workflow for your best system and also to deploy the intelligence to upgrade from time to time your best system, which have been already deployed in the field, in the locations. Yeah. So I think that is something I we see that is something that we can start thinking now and can we can put this concept into our design. And uh, we will, I would also like to do a quick advertise about this topic is that in coming December 1st, we are going to have a webinars with one of our partner, Cure. They are specializing in artificial intelligence and predictive maintenance and the better analytics topic, especially for batteries. So they are going to give you more insight about how the battery analytics can be useful for the best system nowadays you are looking at. So I would just like to do a quick wrap up about this three headwind. So we have been discussed about this three headwind that we foresee as HMS. The first one is the product flexibility, how we can work with cross vendors, how we can integrate different systems to different systems. And the second one is that after this system has been rolled out, how we can improve our total cost of ownership how we can improve our operations based on the commissioning, maintenance, based on the remote access, over-the-air capabilities, how we can do that. And the next part is that after that, how we can do more to optimize the existing assets have been rolled out and to bring more value, to bring more revenues for us in the futures. So Andy, back to you. Maybe we can do the next poll. Thanks very much, Yuan. Yeah, so our fourth and final poll, everyone, has launched. Um, there should be a pop-up on your screen this time to prompt you to answer not only that, but you can also go back and reply uh, to the previous uh, ones as well if you haven't already done that. And it'll be fun for us to uh, collate all of those at the end. So I uh, would like to ask you, the audience, um, which of these do you see as the primary headwinds to the scalability of battery energy storage systems, either now or in the immediate future? And is it going to be battery supplier flexibility? Is it grid integration flexibility? Is it installation and maintenance efficiency? You could choose performance and lifecycle optimization or condition monitoring and failure prediction. And I just want to note as before that you can actually reply, uh, respond with more than one answer to these as well. Um, so see what you think. I'm watching the results come in already and it's, uh, yeah, a bit of a neck and neck race between some of the, uh, some of the options there. Um, but we'll come back to those results in a minute. So. Guys, we're just about to go. We've only got time for a couple of audience questions today, but um, I think you very eloquently put forward um, your arguments on what the headwinds are for battery storage uh, in terms of data communications and you know some suggestions on how to solve them and some suggestions that you know there's various strategies. But I don't know if maybe you want to perhaps without sort of direct reference to a particular customer or you know leaving out any obviously commercially sensitive information, but just like to see how you kind of arrived at the uh, your understanding of these headwinds and maybe if there's a customer problem in the real world that you've solved that kind of helped inform your, your thinking around this maybe? These are, that's a tough one to answer quickly, Andy. I guess uh, what I would probably cite, and it, it sort of goes to, I'm, I'm interested to see the, the, the spread of the answers here to the last poll. Um, mm -hmm. 
at one point, battery supplier was you know, flexibility was was at the top of the list. Although it's, it's neck and neck, I had a tough time choosing myself. These are all issues. Which one do you pick, right? Which one do you go after? Which fire do you address? That's the that's the question. I would say specifically related to the battery supplier flexibility, because it happens to fall into the area of expertise of the ICSOT uh, business unit inside of HMS, but because naturally so many uh, battery suppliers leverage can um, that happens to be an area of expertise for us. So we've been approached um, from some different OEMs looking for future around this topic. Um, and so one of the things we're considering is, like I said, more of a, uh, I'll call it a data aggregator, uh, a more flexible device that can serve that purpose so that the battery uh, supplier can continue to offer what they offer um, and they don't have to necessarily transform their business. Same for the biz, uh, for the best company, uh, we can, you know, we can add our value to that equation. Um, so, so that's that's the main goal there. That's another reason we want the input from from the audience is what are they seeing uh, in, in terms of protocols that, they, that they'd like to incorporate in, internal to the mess. Awesome. So, in that extra time that we gave them there, while you answered that question to respond to the poll, I don't know. I don't know if any of them changed their minds mid answer there from you, but um, we can see that, yeah, uh, actually, battery supply flexibility is almost top, but it's uh, on 25% of the vote. Uh, and in fact, performance and life cycle optimization. So, I mean, that's to say they're all important, aren't they? Clearly, you know, that's and it's a little bit, a little bit arbitrary, but I think it's an interesting, yeah. interesting exercise, isn't it? So, Running down yep. them in order for the audience, uh, performance and life cycle optimization is top with 28%. Battery supplier flexibility, 25%. Grid integration flexibility is almost as close, however, with 22%. Uh, condition monitoring and failure prediction on 18%. And installation and maintenance efficiency on 7%. So guys, that kind of tally with what you would have expected? It's really a tough one. I, I was completely open on this. I would have, if I had to pick three, I'd pick the battery supplier, I'd pick the condition monitoring and, and the performance and life cycle. So we're, we're right up there. Um, so the majority of the audience, uh, in terms of my perspective. Excellent. You on any, any wildly differing views or pretty much? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think, I think I'm, I'm curious about the, 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 the grid integration flexibilities. So I, I actually would like to understand more about what kind of uh, uh, headwinds uh, the, the audience have been facing in the grid integration, because we, we have heard a few, and uh, but we also have heard that uh, currently in the, in the grid uh, network uh, operators, they have several different ways to, to solve out the capability to integrate with different type of best system. But I'm also, we would like to hear more about this, how we can also help to get us to address this questions and topics. And also for performance and life cycle optimization, I think that is also something that uh, the, the best systems uh, uh, companies have been asked every day, day by day by the customers that compared to another vendors, what your performance can be and uh, and uh, what will be the life cycle for the futures. But however, I think that is something can be more value added in the future is that how you can add up after the customer buy out your best systems and you can add up more value on that. And in fact, I think uh, some of that, particularly around life cycle optimization, uh, we will be discussing in our next webinar together uh, yeah. on the 3rd of December. We'll be joined by um, our fr friends of Energy Storage News, mutual friends of ours uh, at uh, Acure Battery Intelligence and Analytics Company. So before we go, guys, a uh, couple of quick questions from the audience. And so audience member uh, Paul Soskin asks, uh, yeah. before going to build, uh, what questions should asset owners ask control system experts and or battery energy storage system suppliers in order to ensure minimal delays and robust communications for all markets? I wish that I had the ability to, to ask a follow-up question of Paul to clarify. Um, I, I'm not quite sure. So... I think it really just depends on what protocols they can support 
externally probably it, it depends on the asset owner's requirements what their dso requirements are it, it just depends on so many different options but i would try to unpack that uh, a little bit more with with the best supplier do they offer multiple options um, how could they achieve multiple options for that flexibility if flexibility is a flexibility and robustness i think or what would paul say minimal delays and robust for all markets that's that's really the key um so I, I wish I could understand Paul's perspective on that question, where, where his uh, vantage point, but uh, maybe uh -huh. we can maybe we can catch it back to the session. But um, yeah, I, you know, where that question is coming from, I guess. Yeah, I, I think I think uh, uh, for, for this question is that uh, actually uh, when, when we when we look at the best uh, company when they start integrating for their projects and they work with different best suppliers or the the end user work with the best suppliers. And the, the, they often, they, sometimes they, they, they are not uh, very focusing on the communications issues and not trying to address them in the very beginning of the project discussions. And we also see that in some mega projects that or giga project we see in the market, it's also sometimes happened because they are thinking that the, 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 the best system, entire system is kind of modularization design. I can buy this from these vendors and not one from another suppliers. And in the data sheet, they mentioned they both support this communication line, so it should work, you know. So sometimes the, the integrators or sometimes people will take the communications as a as kind of granted. This is also something that what I have done in the previous conversation with some customers. And they didn't uh, the, the kind of uh, look into more detail about what is the restrictions and what is the limitation for this type of communications. And what will be the question that we should ask in advance to make sure that the, there's no interoperability issues between these two machineries or these two systems. So for example, a, a classic scenario is on the CAN bus. So the CAN bus is a commonly used uh, protocols in machinery also nowadays in the best. But when you start connecting the CAN network together and the distance is become a very important topic because the, the CANVAS distance has limitations based on the data rate you're using, based on the data you're putting at, and also the topology has also some limitations. So if you start running out your project, you can basically think about what kind of uh, uh, components, topology component you can use in the beginning to address if you want to design this uh, best scope of topologies, what kind of component like repeaters, like bridges that you can use to avoid the signal issues during the data transmissions, or maybe like adding extra gateways as communicators to converting different type of protocols or start changing like this, the, the identifier between the communication of each. I think that is some question that we can address or the, the best company or the user can address in from during the project in the beginning and to make sure that these are not going to generate delay for your project. Because yeah. sometimes, especially during this component shortage, everything that you forget to address in the beginning, you end up with the component shortage issues and you can find solutions, but you are not able to get the right they release. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, we're seeing plenty of other causes for delays for you know for various industries, including energy storage at the moment. And yeah, no uh, no real desire to add to that, I guess. So there's a question here from uh, Serge Peters. Um, who'd like to know if uh, you're considering that more connectivity standards are needed according to the location where the best will be installed in the grid. Um, for example, industrial customers will have different needs uh, than a grid operator. Um, who'd like to take this one on? Uh, I can feel that one. I think that was a great question. Uh, and what that points out to me, it reminded me that in, in our slides, we actually left out a couple of protocols. We talked about industrial use cases, but we left out some of the industrial protocols, uh, which are they're more or less ubiquitous, similar to, to, the, to the grid side. So, so if you're integrating a BES into an industrial environment, you're not gonna find these grid protocols, you're gonna find more industrial. Um, so it's, it's a really good point. Um, and yes, so, so the list should have been even longer, could have been even longer, uh, in terms of the different languages that, that a, a, an energy storage system needs to be able to speak depending on where, where it's going to be installed and how it's going to be used. So I, I think it's a great question. Um, I'm not sure how to answer it. And then yeah, I, I, I think, I think, I think it's, it's, 
basically it depends on the grid uh, operators you are working with and also it's really i agree that this based on the geographic and locations where you are going to put your best system at so if you are you if you want to the installation is going to be rolled out in, in america i think the dmp3 is going to be commonly asked and if it's going to be rolled in europe the ic61 f50 if that is something i've been putting up by the national by the nation grid of the countries and that can become a mandatory part in the discussions for your installations but so far as i see currently like in europe i still not just see that the the, the dso's and the grid operators they put up a hard requirement for the best system because they are still thinking that the best is currently uh, additional systems is is outside their grid at the moment they only install that when needed. But in the future, when we start requiring more supercharging stations, the, the battery system will need it to add in, in each supercharging stations. And it becomes a mandatory for the grid to look at to install is geographically and over the countryside. And after that, they will start thinking about, should I handle that as a separate system or should I also handle that as a network inside their substations, communications or telecommunication network and also using the same management system or visualization system or data control system to monitor all of them, then the IC61 F50 or DMP3 or this type of uh, energy protocols might become a mandate in this type of project. Yeah. Right. So I guess, you know, it's a question of as the scale and reach of the industry, yeah, just continues to grow and grow and grow. That's obviously yet another thing that's going to have a bearing and you know then there's also where it is regards to load pockets in the grid and therefore what other kinds of uh, energy resources it will be interacting with and yeah so i think that's presumably a, a a question that both of you guys would be more than happy to to go into in much further detail than we unfortunately have time remaining for today um so just want to thank everybody that joined us for what's been a really interesting session. Um, thank you so much for all your participation with the polls and stuff. Uh, that's been really exciting to see and been fun to, to hear the guys debating over that as well. So as mentioned, recordings will be sent out. Um, you can get them from uh, your registration for the webinar and you will also uh, be able to follow up with any questions asked and you'll be able to see the poll results in full as well. With that, guys, I just want to say thank you very much to all of our audience and finally to our speakers, uh, Yuan and Matt from HMS Networks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone for their participation and good luck soon. That's it. Awesome. Have a nice day. Cheers. Thank you.